Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is John Lanchowski. I'm president of the Institute, and I uh, welcome you all here. Uh, I am delighted to introduce our distinguished speaker today, who happens to be a member of our faculty, Alan Messer. Uh, just for those of you who are new to the Institute, you should be aware we are an independent graduate school. We've got now five master's degree programs, a new doctoral program, 17 graduate certificate programs, and a faculty of, of scholar practitioners. About half our students are recent college grads, and the other half are mid-career professionals from all sorts of relevant uh, agencies, armed services, uh, relevant private sector companies and NGOs, and, as well as from foreign governments and other lands. Um, I, uh, today, um, Alan Messer is going to be talking about uh, the, uh, the foundations of a free economy. And uh, Alan has a, uh, a remarkable career having served in the CIA for 32 years, first as an analyst on Soviet uh, defense industries and economics, and then uh, working in the Directorate of Science and Technology, and then as an operations officer uh, in the clandestine service, specializing in the KGB and uh, Soviet military intelligence, the GRU. Uh, Alan has a, a master's in international affairs from uh, my alma mater, Johns Hopkins uh, School of Advanced International Studies, and another master's degree in economics from UCLA. Here at IWP, he teaches a very unusual course called A Counterintelligence Challenge, The Enigmas and Benefits of Defectors. Uh, it's an extraordinary course on how to think about the evidence that is being uh, proffered by defectors. Um, and uh, it's the kind of course that I believe everybody who is involved in intelligence collection and analysis should take. Uh, but, it, uh, but we restrict our enrollment in this course because it requires so much individual attention by Professor Messer uh, that uh, we can't have everybody study it. But I wish I could multiply him many times. An extraordinary man, and uh, we are really blessed to have him on our faculty. I will, without further ado, I will turn the podium over to Alan. Thank you very much, John. Thank you. Well, I hope I can live up to something like that. Um, as I said, my name is Alan Messer, and I'm here to present an argument examining American governance and making a possible unique comparison of economic democracy and political democracy. In the process, I hope to show that this is the mechanism that governs and regulates much of what we do, not government, and it does this far more efficiently than political democracy. In the process, it will draw on a variety of conclusions about the consequences of liberty, the consequences of equality, and the impossibility of democratic socialism. So first of all, who am I? Well, John has already described some of my background, as you can see. I am not a Nobel Prize winning PhD uh, professor of economics in our universities with many books to buy credit on the subject. Um, I, I have a master's degree in economics that's got to be 50 years old, 45 years old. Uh, but I have been sort of an autodidact all my life when it comes to economics. I read about it constantly. I think about this constantly. Um, but that's really not the point. You know, uh, authority is nothing more than another fallacy of relevance. You know, it, it, it matters not who I am or what my credentials are. What matters is the substance of what I'm about to say and whether it is true or false. Uh, so let me ask a couple of questions of you in the audience. How many of you are favorably disposed to socialism? Oh, good. One or two of you. I've got one of you. I'm glad you came. I wish there were more. I really do. I, I, 
I'm looking, I would look forward to having people who disagree with me be present. How many of you are basically comfortable with America's mixed economy, plus or minus things on the fringes? How many of you are not? Okay, there's only two of you who are not, so most all of the rest of you must be pretty comfortable with it at least. Okay, fine. Who doesn't believe in democracy? Okay, no hands go up. Okay, so who believes in democracy? Just to make sure that, okay, everybody believes in democracy. Really? Do you really believe in it? Well, we're going to find out. Partisans of the left attack capitalism because it, it produces inequality or a privileged class, while partisans on the right all too often uh, debate back with cliches or bromides. Uh, and while the cliches are often true, they're not very illuminating. And what is missing so often from the conversation in this country is any real description, any real understanding of what is the fundamental justification for all of this. Um, you know, this is, uh, we have neglected the real essence, not of capitalism, because I don't believe in that, I don't believe in capitalists, but of the free market. Uh, so, for all the elaborate discussion about the nature of economics and the workings of the market, both micro and macro, some essentials have escaped popular notice. Our educational institutions hype democracy, and some of the more uh, <coughs> leftists have long argued for something they call participatory democracy. All of this is supposed to be in service of the socialist ideal of tangible equality, and don't think the socialist ideal is not real and living in the breast of many Americans at this point. A recent Gallup poll revealed that 37% of Americans now prefer socialism over capitalism. And this includes 57% of Democrats and 16% of Republicans. So let me begin this discussion with a pure assertion. And the assertion is this, the free market is the most democratic instrument ever devised by man and far more democratic than its political counterpart. The contrast between these two, I think you'll see, is as dramatic as it is unknown. What is the evidence for this assertion? Let's begin by talking about the process. In the political marketplace, every citizen receives a vote, one vote. In the economic marketplace, consumers receive more than one vote. You know, they receive, I've got five, I've got 20, I've got 100. If you go out there and buy a car, you're talking thousands, and if you buy a house, you're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars of votes. And we could call these cash votes. In the political marketplace, only registered adult and national citizens can vote. In the economic marketplace, anyone with cash votes can vote, and you often don't need a uh, picture ID. In political democracy, your vote must be cast at a polling booth on obscurity road, in a location with utterly inefficient, uh, deficient parking and long lines. In the economic marketplace, you can go to any mall, strip mall, or random shop throughout the town. In political democracy, you can only cast your one vote every two or four years. And then it must be on the first Tuesday of the 11th month of the year or some variation on this theme. In the economic marketplace, you can cast your many votes seven days a week. In normal store hours, cramp your style, you can always go online at midnight. So economic democracy is exercised 24-7. In the political marketplace, once the consumer has voted and the politicians take their seats in the legislature, the game is fixed for at least two years. Those electing President Obama in November of 2008 had to live with the result for at least the next two years, if not longer. In the economic polling booth, consumers vote, but then they get to vote again. The producer reconsiders the results of his first round of votes and either improves the features of his product 
or, or generates more efficiency, allowing him to reduce his price or both. He re-enters the polling booth with the new offer and consumers cast another round of votes, and this goes on perpetually. In this sense, think of the producer's preliminary activities as an electoral primary, where he is voting for buildings and machinery, workers, buying materials, administrative equipment, etc. Here the producer casts his votes for an economic candidate, his product. He then brings it to the final election, and the consumer voters now have the final say. But this is a voting cycle that is going on continuously, and adjustments and improvements in the resulting products and services are happening daily. In the political marketplace, you must vote for one winner, which means you are voting against all the other losers. And it is winner take all. The losers and their causes are vanquished from the playing field. It's a zero-sum game. In economic democracy, pools of voters may cast the majority vote for one option, but the minority, in many cases, can cast enough votes to make the minority option profitable enough to both continue producing and even improving the product over time. Even extremely small fractions of the total market vote can have meaningful consequences. Visit the quilt company in Durango, Colorado, as I have, or woodcrafters in Leesburg, Virginia, which I have, and note the enormous variety of specialty products involved. There are only an estimated 1.3 million quilters in this country and perhaps 5.7 million woodworkers. But there are 126 million households. So the 1% quilters and the 4.5% woodworkers have managed through their votes to leverage two industries into producing an exceptional technology and variety of products. Think Apple computers initially capturing only a fraction of the computer market, but still incentivized to improve the product year after year. Who generates faster rates of progress, Apple or the Corps of Engineers? This is not a zero-sum game. Furthermore, in the economic marketplace, you can cast your many votes for more than one candidate. You can buy both a Ford and a Honda or a Schlitz and a Budweiser. There is a disparity between these two in the motivation-driven knowledge you see in, in each form. Why vote in the first place? In the 2000 presidential election, only 67% of registered voters bothered to vote. Why so low? A rigorous calculation of the probability that your vote would determine the outcome of that election was smaller than the number of elementary particles in the universe, or the age of the universe in seconds. In contrast, a vote in the economic democratic marketplace fetches the immediate reward, the product or service itself. At the same time, low voter turnout for any given product or service is often irrelevant to a meaningful response for producers, even if it means that it goes out of business. Finally, in economic democracy, the voting consumer is much more motivated to learn about the meaning of his vote. He may consult consumer reports, Motor Trends, CNET, or a variety of other outlets on the internet. And I suspect that we spend far more time on the internet researching products and services than we ever will spend researching political issues. And this is a measure of the relative democratic motivations. In the political marketplace, the citizen casts exactly one vote for a president, and that vote is supposed to convey the voters' preferences regarding everything, from North Korean embargo policies, NAFTA negotiations, Arab-Israeli peace talks, and defense spending on the B-2 bomber, to securities regulations, health care, education, minimum wages, social security, oil drilling, and toddler safety. Pundits and pollsters spend weeks and months trying to discern what the vote actually meant. And the debates go on endlessly with little resolution. In contrast, the consumer casts his cash votes, each one for a specific issue called a product or a service. There is no ambiguity about the meaning of these votes. Whether Microsoft or Apple, Honda or Ford or Citibank or Chase is preferred can be seen clearly from the cash votes cast and counted. One vote, one issue. Because the consumer's cash vote is so clear, 
clever opponents, politicos, and advisors cannot presume to divine from the cash flow some glimmerings of public discontent ranging from a toaster to a refrigerator to a summer vacation or a toddler toy. The cash flow was for the toddler toy and not the hatchback, pure and simple, take it or leave it Toyota. If the vote is difficult to interpret, it should not be surprising that it does, that it does not translate, translate faithfully into action. Politicians are famous for making promises they have no intention of keeping. Do we remember Lyndon Johnson promising in October of 1964? We are not about to send American boys nine or 10,000 miles away from home to do what Asian boys ought to be doing for themselves. I remember this one. Or President Obama's famous, if you like your health care plan, you can keep your health care plan guaranteed, period. Neither one of these promises was kept, and they were known to be false at the time. These are only the more brazen of the many violations of truth in advertising that plagues political democracy. The contrast to this is economic democracy. Here the promise has already materialized and is delivered and on a store shelf. If products are sold under false pretenses, the word spreads fast and accountability comes swiftly, as we shall see shortly. If the political vote does not translate directly into actions, one reason is the lack of accountability. Nowhere is the contrast between political democracy and economic democracy more dramatic than in their respective treatments of accountability. In the political marketplace, a citizen casts exactly one vote for a president, and as I have said before, that vote is supposed to convey voter preferences for everything from North Korean embargo policies to toddler safety. No single elected official can be held accountable for progress in all of these issues. To make matters far worse, the principal occupation of Congress can be summarized in one word, evasion. Almost no single provision of any 2,000-page law comes equipped with an author or a detailed justification. Special interest provisions and exceptions are smuggled into legislation all the time. Call it stealth lawmaking. Identification is at the heart of accountability. But where is the identification of both the provisions of the legislation, their justification, and the sponsors of each provision? In 2010, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi said, but we have to pass the health care bill so you can find out what is in it away from the fog of the controversy. Now, while this appeared to many to be an outrageous joke, it was essentially very true. Over 2,000 pages of the bill did little more than subcontract the lawmaking to an unaccountable Secretary of, House of, of Health and Human Services. That the controversy ended up or led up to the bill was a fog carefully orchestrated by the likes of Pelosi, only added an insult to the very concept of thoughtfulness complementing injury to democratic lawmaking. Meanwhile, does anyone know the identity of any person who wrote any provision in the Obamacare law? As if this were not sufficiently subversive of political democracy, the sheer breadth and depth of all these issues has driven Congress to evade responsibility systematically by divesting itself of legislative powers and passing them along to uncontrolled government entities such as the Federal Reserve Board, the IRS, OSHA, HUD, Fannie and Freddie, where accountability goes to die. And this divestiture by Congress suggests something deeply sinister, which we will revisit later on. Evading responsibility is one of the main purposes in drafting legislation. In contrast to this, each company in economic democracy is accountable to the consumer directly. While a president can dodge around from education to taxes to North Korea, Korea constantly evading accountability with the sub voter by changing subjects, Walmart cannot. Either it provides a good service to the individual consumer and earns the cash votes, or it does not. Either the Chevy or the Honda is a good car, or it is not. The CEO of Walmart cannot suddenly change the subject 
and scramble to the irrelevant issue of automotive gas mileage or better premiums from GEICO. The producer stands or falls on the service it provides, even with market advertising. False advertising cannot evade consequences. That is the process. Now we ought to ask ourselves about the outcomes of this process. And before we do that, we need to discuss a very essential constraint on some of this. In economic democracy, the issue of equality of process is inextricably linked to the equality of outcome. The result is not obvious because it starts with a recognition of something that our communist sensibilities inherently reject. For the ugly truth about human nature is its sheer inequality. The most dominant feature of humanity is the utter inequality of all of us. The most dominant feature of the pick of human quality and inequality becomes self-evident. How many can play basketball like a Michael Jordan? Or play a piano like a Billy Joel? Or discover esoteric theories of physics like an Albert Einstein? Extreme examples to be sure. But any random classroom will reveal variations in achievement with some being better at math, some at spatial reasoning, some at language and poetry, some at physical crafts or managerial organization or leadership or evil or love. We are all unequal and unequal in dozens of different ways. Those who can't tie their musical shoes can solve an equation in crafts and furniture. Inequality that does arise in the economic marketplace follows the rewards going to those with true talent, skills, experience, leadership, organization, physical achievement, hard work, or the courage to run risks. The economic rewards generate economic inequality. But all of this is the outcome of voting in true economic democracy. The people vote for it. If Oprah Winfrey earns $90 million a year as an adored host of a TV show, she is devoting her talent for the entertainment of millions of viewers who don't have to pay a dime to see her. Well, they've got to buy a television set. But some of, the, some of them must buy a television set, but in the process, they voted for her, and she gives back. By the time he filmed American Gangster, the popular actor Denzel Washington was earning $20 million a film. That film grossed over $266 million and did so for one main reason, Denzel Washington. For simplicity's sake, let's assume that all revenue is earned by selling $10 movie tickets. Thus, tw over 26 million fans would have voluntarily surrendered a $10 bill each because the movie gave them more pleasure than the value of the $10 bill. <coughs> Denzel was a net giver, not a taker. And in the process, he would have earned 75% on every ticket. So he earned his millions by selling tickets, three silver dollars at a time. Well, over 26 million people voted and gained over $266 million in enjoyment. In this manner, the wealth of Denzel's talents was distributed to the masses. Likewise, a Jack Welch, who organized and directed a company that employed 315,000 people at General Electric, providing them paychecks every month to support their families and their life's ambitions. In the process, he earned $94 million a year. Each customer, consumer, probably spent no more than 75 one thousandth of a penny paying for Welch's salary. But in return, they enjoyed the benefits of camcorders, kitchen appliances, jet travel, electricity, and medical imaging devices. Welch was only responding to the millions of cash votes to provide these benefits to his consumer constituency. Here is how wealth gets distributed in a free economy. The value of a millionaire like Winfrey Washington or Welch is distributed to millions of consumers who validate that value every day they freely pay the price for voting. So having dealt with the fundamental constraint in all of this, what about the real outcomes? So where does the equality come into this? Lefty will charge that the wealthy have far more influence than John Q, 
In fact, this is nonsense in the marketplace. While the overall income level of the individual consumer might appear to be a serious constraint, it is not always so. For one thing, some options and products are more intensely desired by some people than others, regardless of income. And those partisans of the product will spend a higher proportion of their income, even if they have a meager income, than someone vastly richer but indifferent to the product. Thus, a poor man intensely attracted to a movie may spend more on CDs and iPods than Bill Gates. Far more importantly, sheer, num sheer numbers of voters matter even more in the economic marketplace than in the political marketplace. The relatively meager income of the average individual may be dwarfed by a Bill Gates, but Bill Gates is only one man, and the masses are just that, the masses. They give Denzel his three orders, 26 million of them over time. In the process of this voting, there is a substantial donation to the masses and a donation that is truly egalitarian. Apart from the donation of capital to foster productivity and new products and services, there is the egalitarian donation of falling prices. When the price of a product falls, it falls for everyone equally and no trickle down. In fact, the price falls disproportionately for poor people than rich. A $400 savings is clearly a larger fraction of an income of $20,000 than $1 million. Think of this as sort of a reverse graduated tax. Think Henry Ford selling his first Model A to a wealthy dentist in 1903 for $880. That included a rear seat, a top, and an eight horsepower engine. Production averaged 875 cars annually in 1903 and four. In 1908, he introduced the Model T at $850 per car and produced 10,666 of them. If the profit margin were 50%, Ford would have earned $4.5 million. To increase profits, he had to expand his consumer base, appealing to the masses, even though each one was substantially shorter of those cash votes. How do you grow your appeal and solicit more of those votes? You cut costs and in the process collect many more votes from far more customers. When he introduced the Model T in October of 08, at a price of $850, he produced about $6,000, 6,000 cars annually. But he also went at a cost cutting with a single-minded obsession and the cost per car came tumbling down. And as it did, sales increased dramatically. By 1925, he was producing 2 million cars a year at a price of about $260. If he only fetched 10% profit, Ford would have realized $52 million in earnings. In this case, total profit would have skyrocketed over 11 times per year, even though the profit rate fell 80%. In the process, by the time production ended, Ford distributed a product widely desired by 15 million people of modest means, and Model T's comprised about 55% of all cars on the road. In time, the anti-union Ford understood that productivity should be rewarded. In January 1914, Ford doubled the average wage of his workers from $2.50 a day to $5, and reduced hours to an eight-hour workday. No government ordered him to do this. It simply made private economic sense. If he wanted to retain an experienced, trained workforce that was contributing to the ever-expanding sales of Model Ts, in essence, Ford was voting for the workers and skills he needed. Here is a true egalitarianism and all brought to us by a greedy capitalist pig. But what is the reduction in price? It is not simply a statistic in an economic research project. When you compare the $590 savings from 1908 to 1925 to the average per capita income of $770, the car buying public experienced a 77% increase in its real income from just one product purchase. Without the market-driven trend towards greater equality, how can we explain the statistical course of poverty prior to the Great Society? 
And this chart, which you see there, is a collapse of poverty by about 55% over 17 years. Okay? And what has the political democracy of the great society accomplished? As you can see, right now we spend over a trillion dollars cumulatively, and the poverty rate has essentially gone nowhere. So now, who controls capital? Well, this is true enough, but we've seen lefty will respond that the billionaires and millionaires have all the power because they have all the capital, and capital investment is what drives the economy, right? In the voice of a socialist, inequality is often expressed as the inequality of power. The plutocrats of capital command billions of dollars in wealth that controls our lives, or something like that. This viewpoint explains the historic obsession of communists and socialists with nationalizing capital. Controlling capital has always been the ultimate goal. Studies of the wealthy show that the rich devote an inordinate share of their income to savings and investment. Data from the U.S. Bureau of Economic Analysis indicates that the national personal savings rate is currently 5.4%. However, America's 1%, that rate is as high as 51%. Their savings and investments are essentially the jobs program of a private economy. But does that dominance in the investment arena give them real power? I would suggest to you only in political democracy. The fallacy is easily demonstrated. In the economic marketplace, the entrepreneur doesn't care about special acts for any interest. He wants to maximize his profit. Profit increases with increasing sales. High numbers, and you don't get high numbers by appealing to the Warren Buffets of the world. Does anyone really believe that Steve Jobs developed the iPod for the purpose of marketing it to his millionaire buddies? In this case, it was the great mass of poor and middle-income Americans who drove the development, totally outvoting the Soros, Buffets, and Gates of the Gucci Seven. If Steve Jobs did not develop the iPod to sell to the likes of Warren Buffett, innovators like him do rely on the Warren Buffetts of the world for the capital to develop their products. This explains why Nordstrom's capitalization was only $7 billion and employed only 72,500 workers, while Walmart's capitalization was $258 billion and employed 2.3 million people worldwide. Have you been in a Walmart recently to observe the variety in the prices? What really matters is not the number of votes that some one person has, but the number of votes actually cast for a particular issue. How does consumer voting drive capital investment decisions? The votes in the economic marketplace for consumer goods generate what economists call derived demand for computer investment. Based on this, voters and manufacturers, small retailers, all cast votes in the capital goods market, voting for labor, machinery, buildings, computers, paper, and pencils. As with consumers, businesses can increase or decrease their votes within the limits of either their income or their financial backing. Once the producer has spent time configuring his product or service with all the features he believes the consumer would want, he is at liberty to set his price. Think of this as a reverse auction where the producer sets an asking price. The combination of product features and price then attracts consumers. Initially, the offer attracts a certain quantity of votes. Transactions are concluded and the good or service is sold, and those sales either validate or they invalidate the investment and may signal the desire for increased investment. And throughout all this, make no mistake, Warren Buffett is chasing the capital investment that is best driven by consumer demand. The billionaires and millionaires do not drive the pattern of capital investment. They are the tail being wagged by the consumer dog as he casts his vote. In contrast, as we have seen, the power of wealth is vastly different in the arena of political democracy, and it leads to vastly different results. In political democracy, even the left has admitted that the role, the role of millionaires and billionaires in a massive concentrated effort to corrupt the outcomes. But the left fails to acknowledge the true dimensions of the problem. For in America, we have a true nomenclatura, a true political bureaucratic elite that acts in the same manner, 
While lobbyists clearly intend to bribe politicians with campaign contributions and the volunteer work of their membership, as in unions, politicians are bribing special interests, and on a far more massive scale. Think the bridge to nowhere that was proposed to connect an island of 50 people and the local Ketchikan airport in Alaska at a projected cost of $398 million. An Alaska senator and Alaska representative could push this notion with a straight face for two simple reasons. It would buy votes of constituents, and the money was free to the congressman. Here is a rate of return to the congressman of infinity. Thousands of government projects follow the same logic. But was this the verdict of political democracy writ large? In the, in the marketplace, reward, if the marketplace rewards entrepreneurial skill, risk running, and excellence by serving the consumer, the political marketplace almost invariably rewards charlatans. And charlatans swim in a sea of corruption. Even leftists readily admit that in politics, special interest minorities with intense passion over an obscure issue can seize their favorite Renapal, showering him with campaign contributions and ram legislation through that grant special privileges that the vast majority would oppose if they were paying attention or allowed to pay attention. Thus, farmers rob the larger population blind with subsidies, as do the corporate giants engaged in international trade or Wall Street bankers with bailouts. Studies of corporate political contributions and lobbying show enormous returns to this kind of investment. One study in 2015 concluded that the average returns from lobbying expenditures in the energy sector was estimated to be over 130%. During the 111th Congress, the oil, gas, and coal industry gave $347 million in campaign contributions. The same Congress approved over $20 billion in subsidies for the fossil fuel industry for a return on investment of 5,600%. So what would you invest in? Pharmaceuticals at 14% or politics at 5,600%? And what are the consequences of all this? In the realm of political democracy, the big dig in Boston was economic nonsense on steroids. But the special interests of powerful construction unions and elite academics in Charleston eager to preserve a pristine skyline view combined to lobby for the biggest waste of infrastructure spending in decades. In the end, uh, when it was promised, the big dig was estimated to cost $6 billion. In the end, it produced one and a half miles of highway at a cost of $22 billion and took 16 years to build, protected by a bodyguard of lobbyists and politicians. In the economic marketplace, the Alaska pipeline cost $7 billion and took three years to build. And this included an entire marine tanker terminal, 800 miles of pipeline, and 12 large pumping stations. One responded to the market and one responded to politics. Or consider Solyndra and its half a billion dollar loan guarantee that was cashed in at taxpayers' expense when it went broke. And not surprisingly, the practice of corruption is not often subject to legal sanctions because that is the illicit activity of the privileged leadership of political democracy. This clearly short circuits the transmission of voter desires in the political marketplace leaving undemocratic outcomes littered all across the regulatory and budgetary landscape. And just as clearly, this has nothing to do with a free competitive economic marketplace where the transmission mechanism is immediate and direct with relatively less corrupt interference. Consider coercion. In economic democracy, voting does not lead to coercion. In political democracy, it does. The voter in the, the marketplace who votes for a Ford may help the commercial prospects of the Ford Motor Company, but does not coerce his neighbors who want to buy a Chevy. In political democracy, the voters who gave us Obamacare coerced us into losing our health insurance plans while paying extraordinary premiums, as well as skyrocketing deductibles. Is it really so mysterious why economic transactions and competition 
are so much more peaceful than harmonious than political lawmaking. The political repression of economic democracy has a noticeable impact on the freedom to choose. A classic example illustrates this in the case of educational vouchers. This proposal, first serviced by Milton Friedman back in the 1950s, allows parents to collect the sum spent on compulsory monopolistic public schools and spend it on the school of their choice. One of the most notable experiments was the Swedish voucher plan adopted in 1992 that allowed parents to spend vouchers on independent schools, namely private schooling. Up to 1992, the marginal 1% of students attended private schools, but by 2009, the fraction rose to 11%. However, understand about 25% of students live in rural areas where private schools are simply not economical. In some municipalities, the number of students attending these schools has risen to 45% of the total. In the same reform, parents were also allowed to select an alternative public school outside of their municipality. And again, the fraction of parents doing so rose from 12.5% in 1992 to 20, over 25% in 2009, or almost double. This result is not unique. In the famous case of Chile, a voucher program was adopted in 1981 for both elementary and secondary education. And as a result, over 1,000 private schools entered the market and private enrollment increased by 20 to 40% by 1998, surpassing 50% in some urban areas. In the most significant case, the Netherlands adopted a voucher system for education back in 1917. Today, more than 70% of pupils attend privately run but publicly funded schools. While there is controversy over the outcome of vouchered education, there is no denying the fact that once parents were not legally repressed by the state monopoly, significant numbers exercised the choice to get out of state schools. Meanwhile, the controversy illustrates something else that's very significant. Unlike political democracy, the entire debate over vouchers presumes that the exercise of economic democracy in the education arena should be hostage to beneficial outcomes. No benefit, no democracy. In political democracy, do we make the right to vote contingent on beneficial outcomes? Just how responsive is the producer, government, or private enterprise to the dictates of democracy in each case? For this, think Enron. The scandal first began to leak out with a Fortune article on February 20th of 2001 when the stock price was $75 a share. The day Enron leaders deflected questions in a conference call about six months later, the price hit $39, a fall of almost 50%. Enron reported large losses in October and admitted inflating its income in November, and by December the 2nd, little more than nine months later, Enron's stock price was 26 cents and it filed for bankruptcy. On the basis of very imperfect knowledge, economic democracy had taken 285 days to kill Enron. Meanwhile, CNN's Lou Dobbs was literally counting the days waiting for indictments. It took the government 260 days to get the first plea deal and 947 days to and finally indict the head of Enron, Ken, Ken Lay. In contrast to this, in 2000, we were witness to the spectacle of the so-called Florida recount, during which the Florida Supreme Court felt it necessary to hijack the results of political democracy by overthrowing the Florida election laws duly passed by a democratically elected legislature. The dysfunction of Florida was on display, but here we are 18 years later and political democracy has done nothing about this. In contrast to this, the oil embargo of October 1973 and other factors caused the price of oil to skyrocket from three to $12 a barrel, a fourfold increase. So how did the consumer and the industry respond?
Chevrolet, the top selling U.S. brand during the embargo, built more than two and a half million vehicles in 1973. By 1975, production had crashed to just over 823,000 units, a reduction of 67%. Ford fell equally hard, but in 1973, Honda sold 38,857 Civics, and two years later, it sold 102,389 units, or an increase of 163%, two years. Boom. And this was not the only adjustment that was going on. This just illustrates the problem. In facilitating this, the market advantaged the poorer elements of society the most. The rich would be relatively insensitive to rising gas prices, but people of modest means were hurt disproportionately and could defend themselves by trading down to Japanese compacts to avoid the pain. Real consumer choice had a significant impact both on consumer welfare and the cause of conservation. Well, regulatory socialism is perpetually identifying new sins that it can control. We fail to notice the extent to which the market economy stands before us unnoticed as the greatest regulator of society. And the hammer falls sometimes suddenly and sometimes relentlessly. Occupational safety required federal regulation, right? Wrong. OSHA was founded in April of 1971, but occupational accident rates for the combined total of manufacturing and mining fell from 97.9 per thousand to, in 1931 to 40.5 in 1962, falling almost 60% without OSHA. Or take the case of auto safety. On, on August 28th of 2009, a two-car crash killed four people in San Diego, and an NHTSA report released on October 25th found the reason being all-weather rubber floor mats. Three days prior to that, another customer complained about the floor mats. This resulted in two Toyota recalls on the 2nd and 25th of November for both the floor mat and the accelerator pad. Of paddle. Paddle. So how did the market police respond to this? Well, first of all, Toyota common stock peaked on the 4th of November at $80 a share and fell to less than 60 by the 20th of November. It's a little over two weeks. This is a fall of over 25%. In April 2010, Consumer Reports issued a rare don't buy warning and Toyota suspended all sales of its 2010 Lexus SUV. By August 2010, the New York Times reported that Toyota's global auto sales had plunged, leading to a loss of $4.8 billion, the largest in the company's 72-year history. Here is a clear case where economic democracy provides meaningful, rapid regulation of corporate behavior through both the impact on sales and the impact on stock values. Despite the performance of the marketplace over history, the need for regulation of the, meta of the marketplace is self-evident to modern man, right? Well, why not a similar regulation of political democracy and its outcomes? In the first case, we regulate economic democracy and its outcomes. In the second case, however, we reject even the regulation the founders built into the Constitution, the enumerated powers. Does political democracy generate pollution, dishonesty, irresponsibility, waste, fraud, and abuse? Should we regulate free speech, the admissible subjects of a ballot, the vote itself? Or should we simply nullify certain unacceptable outcomes of the vote? Where is the truth and advertising law in political democracy? So now we come full circle to our demonstrated assertion, the free market is the most democratic instrument ever devised by man and far more democratic than its political counterpart. In 1776, Adam Smith announced two truly revolutionary discoveries. Each of these was as meaningful to the history 
of social science as was Einstein's theory of relativity in the realm of physical science. And yet each is habitually ignored. The first great discovery you can see here concerned the role of productivity and increased prosperity is what Smith was basically saying is that as the market proceeds, the division of labor increases, and as it increases, the wealth of the people rises. By this, Smith meant that productivity is the sole, the sole source of growth in our individual prosperity. And both Smith and Karl Marx agreed that the competitive marketplace causes prices everywhere persistently to fall. In fact, Marx's theory of history relied on it. Such is the outcome of productivity. But why do prices fall? In the second great discovery, Smith noted his famous uh, example here of people who will pursue their own selfish ends, their own individual goals in producing, and by some invisible hand, will satisfy the social needs for greater welfare, even though it played no part in their own designs. Here is the explanation of Henry Ford, Winfrey, Washington, and Welch. But note the different outcome from the same motivation in economic and political democracy. Different outcome, same motive. Economic democracy pursuing selfish interests via the hidden hand conduces to improving social good. However, pursuing selfish interests in political democracy is toxic and conducive to political combat over the spoils of political warfare. Here is the perverse visible hand in political democracy. And it should not be surprising that without some artificial legal constraints, such as the venerable innumerable enumerated powers concept, political democracy inevitably ends by attacking economic democracy, and its triumph necessarily spells the end of political democracy itself, which brings us to the subject of socialism. In contrast to this great thinker, we have the offerings of the socialist. In the period from 1902 to the early 1940s, Socialists rose to the intellectual challenge of the great socialist calculation debate. Truly something uh, to be read. It's a fantastic debate that nobody knows about. In this, the defenders of economic democracy first gave concrete form to the governance implied by the socialists, who otherwise had persistently failed to articulate it throughout the 19th century. Having given it form, the defenders of economic democracy proceeded to demonstrate the fundamental fallacies of socialism over and over, and the socialists have never intellectually recovered since. One thread of the socialist cause still persists under the rubric democratic socialism. But how viable is this? As we noted before, in the political marketplace, a citizen casts exactly one vote for a president, a senator, a representative, through whom all legislative issues are to be resolved. As the government reach has extended over every aspect of our lives, the enormity of this task has become obvious. In response, over a hundred years, Congress has repealed not only its own legislative responsibilities, consigning them to uncontrolled government entities like the Federal Reserve, EPA, HUD, Fannie, and Freddie, but it is also pillaged part of the judicial branch. Many regulatory bodies not only formulate laws, they pass it, they interpret it, and when challenged in administrative hearings, they act as the judge, jury, and executioner. Here is the very violation of the separation of powers and the blatant violation of democracy. This divestiture is a flight from accountability, but more importantly, it is a flight from political democracy itself. As just one example of regulatory socialism, the Obamacare law number 2300 pages voted on by a Congress that did not have the time to even read what they were voting on. But as of May of 2013, a total number of pages of rules imposed by the unelected bureaucracy was 9,600, with another 7,400 pages proposed and in the pipeline. 
This totals over 17,000 pages of law. Congress couldn't even read the original bill, and the other 17,000 pages of law is clearly beyond the reach of any democratic process. According to Woodrow Wilson's original blueprint, the administrative state was designed to be government by experts, not Congress and certainly not the public. And how significant is this administrative state? In 2015, federal administrative agencies added over 25,000 pages to the Code of Federal Regulations. Over the course of the Obama administration to that point, the bureaucracy had added an estimated 172,000 pages, while the Bush administration added about 165,000 pages in a comparable period of time. The notion that real democracy could play any role in the adoption of those regulations is pure fantasy. You can have some degree of regulation without socialism, but you cannot have socialism without growing regulation and the subversion of democracy that goes with it. It is no secret why the Europeans have adopted a euphemism to describe the Brussels effect on the European Union. They call it the democratic deficit. Yet democratic socialism is sold to us as the sovereignty of the people. How can any people be sovereign if they are not free and not free to cast a meaningful vote? Marx criticized the private economy for being one of wage slavery. But where everyone's livelihood is dependent in one way or another on the monopoly of government, how can the vote be free of influence if not extortion and bribery? Meanwhile, it is the progressive repression of the more perfect democracy found in the economic marketplace. Furthermore, in its redistributionist form, socialism promotes a direct conflict between equality of outcome and equality before the law. The socialist ideal of material equality can only be achieved by overriding the votes cast in the economic democratic ballot box. Redistribution is essentially pri excuse me, privileging one class of people over another and as the legislative path to redistribution is wandered through a Congress, all manner of special interests become privileged or disadvantaged before the law. In this way, equality before the law is made a mockery. Just look at the exceptions in that primary instrument of redistribution, the tax law. A slow cancer of creeping regulatory socialism marches down the path of tyranny one Soviet commissar at a time. So in the end, do you really believe in democracy? Thank you. Yes, sir.